Dear friends in Christ, may grace and peace be yours in abundance through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Yes, I know that we keep leapfrogging through the story of God's decisive action as told in the Old Testament. Last Sunday, we jumped into Hannah's story, and this Sunday, we plop right in the middle of David's story. The story of David to this point has been the equivalent of white water rafting down the Arkansas River during the spring runoff. You gotta hold on. Oh, and it's a whole lot more fun if you scream a little. But suddenly, in our story this morning, it's nothing. It's still waters. But only apparently. Because the action begins to move inward. David is is praying. This part of the story of David is one of the most important parts of the story in the entire Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. It seems that, that things have finally come together for David. After years of danger and fighting and, and hiding and struggle, David has finally settled into his own house and is able to rest from all of his enemies. However, he's not ready for retirement. And so he starts looking around for, for the next thing to do, and he doesn't have far to look because he just brought the Ark of the Covenant into the city of Jerusalem. And so David decides that he wants to build a house for God. David has his place built of cedar, and God should have God's place built of cedar. But according to scripture, God says, not so fast. In fact, it says, but that same night, the word of the Lord came to to Nathan, to David's pastor, saying, go and tell my servant David, are you the one to build me a house to live in? I haven't lived in a house since the day I brought the people of God out of Egypt. I have been moving about in a tent. And as I have moved about and among my people, Did I ever complain? Did I ever say to any of the tribal leaders, those whom I commanded to to shepherd and care for my people, why haven't you built me a nice solid house with four walls and a cedar roof? It seems that God prefers to travel light, to keep moving, to not settle down into one place for for too long. God's kind of like, well... Ben Ruttenson, an itinerant prospector, a hobo, ably played by the actor Lee Marvin in the 1960 movie and musical Paint Your Wagon. I was born under a wandering star. Oh, I was born under a star. Wheels are made for rolling, mules are made to pack. I never seen a sight that didn't look better looking back. Oh, I was born under a wandering star. Well, David, of course he, he means well. I mean, he's simply trying to to spruce up God's shabby, itinerant, well-worn tent, saying, God God just needs something better than that. It's so embarrassing. And then again, who do you think, and what do you think is, is David's deeper aim? Or to put it another way, whose embarrassment is David really concerned about? You guessed it. It's his own. Today's church, at least in in the first world, and its endless striving for for relevance and and appeal, seems very similar. It keeps trying to increase its attractiveness and respectability, making it cutting edge and and, uh, speaking to the concerns of the day. We in the church are constantly seeking to refurbish and remodel the message and the mission and the worship. I, I wonder if we're if we're doing all of these things to glorify God and to hone the gospel message to sinners, 
Or are we really just trying to save ourselves? Save ourselves from being caught with a deity that, that no one with any real intelligence wishes to admire or be caught with. I wonder, how does one rescue God's reputation without mocking his glory? How does one put up a brick and mortar building for God without insulting the one who creates all things seen and unseen? As you probably know, the temple in Jerusalem, the house of God, was torn down to the ground in about 2,000 years ago. The cathedrals of Europe are empty. And the church in the United States? Boy, you and I are an awful lot like David. We like to take a life with God and make it all about what we do. We tend to start making plans and, and launch into building projects. And these building projects of ours are also known as self-salvation projects and self-reputation projects. We're so eager to, to impress God and others with our projects and, and with our good works and, and with our virtues. And we actually think that these things will all be permanent witnesses. Yep, we're just like David. But God says to David, you want to build me a house? Ah, uh -uh. I'm the one who's building you a house. The kingdom that, that I'm shaping here is not what you do for me, but what I do for you. I'm the one doing the building, not you. If I let you fill the city with the sounds of hammers and chisels and shouts from workers, before long, everyone in town will be caught up in what you are doing and miss out on what I am doing. And what is God doing? Saving sinners. How, you ask? Well, to save the embarrassment, God does so by becoming an even bigger embarrassment. According to the first gospel, according to the first chapter of the gospel of John, God literally sets up tent in the one named Jesus of Nazareth. This Jesus, the son of David through Joseph's lineage, was also born under a wandering star, which the Magi followed. Jesus as a newborn was, was laying not in a well-crafted crib of cedar, but rather in a shabby, quick-hewn manger. And it seems that Jesus prefers traveling light, too, to keep moving, to not settle down in one place for any too long, saying that the foxes have dens and the birds of the, net, birds of the air have nests, and the son of David has no place to lay his head. Talk about shabby housing for a deity. And his body, Jesus' body, becomes tarred with the sins of the world. It was torn and tattered by whip and nails and cross. God dwells in that. Yep, God dwells in that. This Jesus, this son of David, this one who is God incarnate, in sheer and complete love, without any embarrassment, dies for you. As the Bible says, for the message of the cross is foolishness, is an embarrassment to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. And you might remember what happens next, Easter. An event which is even more of an embarrassment because everybody knows that the resurrection just doesn't make any sense. The dead stay dead, but not Jesus. He was raised on the third day, scarred body and all. And then he quickly dispatches a frightened, broken and shabby people like you and me and this church to go out into the world. To do what? To build things? Uh -uh. 
to go and proclaim this simple and to the world a rather embarrassing message, the repentance and forgiveness of sin in his name to all people. It is no embarrassment to need a savior. It is no embarrassment to get on your knees and pray. And it is no embarrassment for your Lord to come and to save you. And it is no embarrassment for him to come and make a home within your life. For God has always preferred the surroundings of the human heart to that of cedar. In our story from 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promises and David trusts and David shelves his building plans and leaves the matter to God. As he writes in Psalm 127, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain and build it, God will and God does. Amen.